Tonight, the compelling story of a Maryland institution. In a general sense, there was a lot of lore in the background of GBMC about the challenges that had to be overcome to get the hospital started. What it takes to, um, to be a doctor is uh, to be a successful one with a good relationship with everybody. It's, not a, it's something that you have to keep up with all the time. The 9-11 event, one of our patients had a son in the building and he watched it go down. This was, in many respects, very scary for doctors. This is the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. Its founding, its challenges, its impact, its history, its future. Hello, I'm Jamie Costello, and welcome to GBMC at 50. Our board was nervous. There was a lot of yelling about health care reform. Healthcare, hold our back. That's a crazy conspiracy. They loved GBMC. They wanted the decision making to remain with the GBMC community. The facts were that the U.S. had the best health care employees, the doctors and nurses were the best but they were operating in a broken system. Are you going to keep my employer from stopping offering insurance and forcing me onto the public option if that's cheaper for their bottom line? Baltimore was very different then from what it is now. You would see these elegant ladies go up to the tea room at Hutzler's and they would wear hats and gloves, the whole works. I remember going when the Orioles came to Baltimore. My father took me to the first game that the Orioles played here. That was a big event. There was no beltway for one thing and on Charles Street was just a little narrow street that you would take from the city or any number of areas. That was sort of a main road. You want to hear about why GBMC was founded? Al Winger told me that uh, his backyard was immediately adjacent to a, the backyard of an administrator of the women's hospital. And Dr. Wenger and this administrator from women's hospital used to uh, stand out by the back fence and discuss, wouldn't it be great if we could put the two hospitals together? And the real reason that the Hospital for the Women of Maryland, Baltimore City, and the Presbyterian Eye, Ear, Nose, and Throat Charity Hospital combined to form GBMC in 1965 was because of resident training programs. They were having residency programs in specialty hospitals and the Association for Graduate Medical Education came down with a ruling that these residency programs needed to be part of a general hospital. It came about because both of the hospitals were too small for the standards that they were coming up with, the number of beds you had to have. So both of them had pressures on them and they were looking for partners. There was a lot of lore in the background of GBMC about the challenges that had to be overcome to get the hospital started. My mother was born and raised here. She was an only child. Her mother, my grandmother, was very active with the women's hospital, which was located at the time in the city in the Bolton Hill area. And she was active in that for a great many years. Through that, my mother got involved in various health-related activities and then went on the women's hospital board and was on that for quite a few years and then was president of it at the time GBMC was being thought of and created. She came to the view in the late 50s that if the women's hospital is going to serve the population that it had been serving and serve it well, it needed a new facility, number one, and needed, number two, to have it in a place where the people were living. And that's what gave rise to the idea of creating a hospital in the northern part of the city or in Baltimore County. Post-World War II, uh, Baltimore County in general was growing a great deal. After the war, there was a great need for housing. You have the baby boom, you have a lot of growth, and in Baltimore County, Towson was one of the towns that was growing almost faster than anywhere else in the county. The Shepherd Pratt property just stood out as a great opportunity because where GBMC is now located, 
was a pasture. Because I, I remember driving by it every day going to, to Calvert School. There were cows up here. This was Shepherd Pratt had a dairy, and this is where the, the cows were. When we heard that a hospital was going to be built there, we thought, oh, no, 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 no. This, this is too beautiful. The rolling hills, the Shepherd Pratt hole, the whole atmosphere was too, just too beautiful to mess with. Jean was born in Ohio. She was a war bride. And Norman's uncle was a physician on staff at the women's hospital. So that seems like a natural introduction for Jean for volunteer work, for something to do for a woman in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And she became a member of the board of Women's Hospital very early on and served in various capacities there. Jean Bacher had a great deal to do with the establishment of GBMC as a member of the board of Women's Hospital. Jean Bacher was the first president of GBMC and followed my mother. Mrs. Bacher and my mother were close friends for a great many years. Mrs. Bacher, I think, played a major role in getting this institution functioning once it was built and things were in place. When they started work, every varmint, every deer, raccoon, rat <laughs> came across and up into our area. Jean Bacher and Elizabeth Yagi are the two to really be congratulated and honored for their work because they were the beginning of all this. They were the ones that had the foresight to go ahead and do something. That's gutsy. That, that's, that's something that, you know, back then, not many women were taken seriously. And those two women were, and they did a beautiful job. Jean was always involved and was the first president of the board here. Paul Becker was one of our first administrators, and, and he was terrific. Jenny Sherwood comes to mind, who was a wonderful character. She was here when the um, OB entrance opened, and the, someone called down to her and said, Jenny, how are things going? Do we have a patient yet? Because people were being transferred from Women's Hospital. And she said, no, she said, but I am sweeping out the leaves. It was fall. I am sweeping out the leaves from the lobby. And she said, a squirrel has just come in, and I'm not sure how to get him out. So a whole bunch of people went down to help her. Um, but in a way, it was very much a family of people who worked here. Everybody knew everybody. By 1960, Women's Hospital and Presbyterian Eye, Ear, and Throat Charity Hospital would officially incorporate as the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. And the site was dedicated in 1962. And then on October the 2nd, 1965, former President Dwight David Eisenhower would attend the official dedication. But what would the actions of another president mean for GBMC? You're gonna find out right after this break. For 50 years, our community members have helped solidify GBMC as a go-to for medical care. Through support from generous donations, partnerships, outreach, and more, GBMC has grown exponentially and will continue to grow in the years to come. To our community members and all who have given or continue to give back to GBMC, thank you for supporting us and for making GBMC Healthcare your go-to for exceptional patient care. A special thanks to Pure as Gold sponsors for the 50th Anniversary Gala, the GBMC Volunteer Auxiliary, the Women's Hospital Foundation, and Physicians Anesthesia Associates, now serving the community as American Anesthesiology of Maryland. GBMC's Volunteer Auxiliary is at the heart and soul of GBMC Healthcare. Its beginnings predate the opening of the hospital's doors, and GBMC would not be the welcoming and warm place that it is without the loving care and hard work of each and every volunteer. To our volunteers at GBMC and Gilchrist Services, thank you for continually making a difference in the lives of our patients and their families. I am proposing today a new national health strategy. It helps more people pay for care, but it also expands the supply of health services and makes them more efficient. It emphasizes keeping people well, not just making people well.
In terms of the actual growth, you have the number of public schools in Baltimore County almost doubling by 1962. The housing is uh, all white. I mean, it was segregated completely. When Frank Robinson came in 1966, it changed a lot about this community. And the Robinsons, Brooks and Frank, sort of merged a lot of different communities in their support for the Orioles. I want to appeal to all the people of the city of Baltimore uh, to remain calm, to be peaceful. The riots in 68 were more severe. They lasted several days, required several days of curfews and an enormous number of arrests. It was uh, known as the Hospital on the Hill and the Upside Down Hospital because I think all equipment and so forth came from the top floor down and there was a, a, what we called a train and the train just went around each floor and delivered uh, medical supplies, delivered food, delivered everything. We had separate operating rooms, separate inpatient units uh, from the two founding hospitals. I think GBMC was the place to work, even though people thought it was way out in the country. But a lot of people came from the city to, to work out here, and I think once a few came, then they, they brought their families, and they were encouraged to do that. Gary Stoneshafer had been considered the finest surgical resident with the best hands <laughs> to come out of Hopkins for a very long period of time. And in working with Hopkins, GBMC was able to attract Gary Stoneshafer, and of course he built the department around himself with a really t terrific group of people. At just about the time that we were opening this hospital, there were some new instrumentation that burst upon the world and actually changed surgery. But suddenly, when fiber optics became hooked to an endoscope, it was like we would, for instance, if we wanted to look into the abdomen, we would first distend it in those days with uh, carbon dioxide and then place the laparoscope in and it illuminated this. It's like being in a circus tent. You know, suddenly you could see everything from top to bottom, from the diaphragm to the pelvis. When I first came here, GBMC was at that time emerging as a leader in minimally invasive surgery. And I can remember back in 1982 or so talking to uh, one of their techs because they put on courses and teaching many, many uh, gynecologic surgeons how to do this technique. And the tech said, you know, we were doing this procedure on a pig the other day, and we took out their gallbladder with the, uh, with the laparoscope. And I said, yeah, that sounds interesting. Sure, certainly sounds like it's easy to do. And that was eight years before the first laparoscopic closed cystectomy was done in this country and done in France in about 1990. So there been a lot of advances here at GBMC in the area of laparoscopic surgery, and we've been in the forefront of minimally invasive surgery ever since. It was an era of excitement. We were really making progress, I think, in helping people. Well, we had a very hard time in the Department of Radiation Therapy. So we were able to reconstitute the department, and we brought in Kelly Drake and Albert Blumberg and later Rob Brooklyn. And, of course, they built a terrific department and set the stage, really, for the establishment of the Cancer Center at GBMC under Gary Cohen. During my tenure as president, we were fighting Maryland General down on Howard Street. They wanted to build a hospital between GBMC and the Pennsylvania line. And we had our legal counsel at the time was a guy named Stuart Rome from Venable Bacher and Howard. Stuart was just a terrific lawyer. Maryland General was winning the fight, but we felt as though they hadn't uh, gone through the process properly. Also, we were noticing the um, shortened length of stays. GBMC was chock full in the 70s and 80s, but we could see the writing on the wall that lengths of stay were getting shorter for patients and that really the region could not support a brand new full service hospital, which is what Maryland General wanted to build. Stuart Rome died tragically right in the middle of the fight. So I called up Jack Schlanger, who was running Venable at the time, and asked if I could meet with him and told him how critical this fight was to the future of GBMC. And he said to me, well, you know, I might see whether I could get Ben Civiletti to undertake that for you. And Ben, of course, had been the United States Attorney General, had a great reputation, and I said, thank you very much, we'll take him. Sheila Riggs at the time, Mrs. Riggs, 
asked me to come on the board since I had become familiar with the hospital and its circumstances. As the progression of medicine occurred, you needed the ability to progress with it, either with new services or additional physicians or equipment and facilities and offices uh, for uh, doctors. So I was uh, passionately uh, in favor of uh, the purchase of the 15 acres, even though it cost a lot of money. And I was not concerned, really, with it putting the hospital in the dumps, so to speak, because I thought we had resources, mainly the people, Joe Keelty and other great philanthropists, who would help us if we needed it. In the early days, we started from scratch as a home care hospice, which is where most of our care is done. A very generous donor, uh, Jeannie Vance, he had the vision for establishing a hospice here in Towson in the Baltimore area. And after, um, I believe, a couple years, the inpatient hospice unit was established, which is on the campus here at GBMC. And it's been a story of growth ever since then to now where we're serving patients across the entire Central Maryland uh, region. Uh, Milton J. Dance Jr., also known as Laddie Dance, uh, was a uh, well-known figure here in, in the Towson area. He was actually a horse auctioneer. And uh, back in the late 70s, uh, Dr. Alvin Wenger, who was the chairman of otorhinology head and neck surgery, and Dr. Robert Chambers, who's a head and neck surgeon here, treated uh, Mr. Dance for cancer very successfully. And because of that experience as a grateful patient, he and his wife, Jenny Vance, founded the Milton Dance Head and Neck Center. I kept thinking that GBMC ought to be able to do something to help people who had a predisposition to genetic disease. So Bart Harvey and I had worked together very closely because he was always on the financial side of things at, at GBMC. And um, he was facing Parkinson's, uh, which his father had also had. And uh, we talked about um, whether he would be willing to help in funding a program like that. And he was just wonderful. GBMC managed to survive, even thrive, during the introduction of Medicare in 1965, failed attempts in Congress to create a single-payer system in 1971, and the 1973 Healthcare Maintenance Act, all of which happened with GBMC still in its infancy. Yet the biggest shift was yet to come. Stay tuned as GBMC at 50 continues. GBMC Healthcare is at the forefront of exceptional medical services and comprehensive care. And this would not be possible without the kindness and compassion of our nurses, the unsung heroes of our healthcare organization. Through their untiring work ethic, self-sacrifice, and commitment to helping others, our nurses provide GBMC patients with positive caring experiences. Thank you for everything you do to make GBMC an exceptional place for medical care. For 50 years, our physicians have been offering compassionate care and a wide range of services to our greater Baltimore community. At GBMC Healthcare, we are proud of the many ways that our physicians live out our vision by providing the care we would want for our own loved ones. Thank you, physicians, for your devotion to your work, your dedication to our patients, and the healing hand you consistently share with our community. It feels good being back on American soil and I'm uh, looking forward to finally having the opportunity to go home. And this afternoon I have a message for the Iraqi people. You will not have to fear the rule of Saddam Hussein ever again. The passion, the joy, the love, uh, the smile on your face when you're on the baseball field that's what I want uh, people to remember. 
There's a whole bunch of people in this country that in the statistics have health insurance, but really what they've got is a piece of paper that says they won't lose their home if they get sick. We must make health care more affordable and give families greater access to good coverage and more control over their health decisions. But this is America. We don't do what's easy. We do what's necessary to move this country forward. And for that same reason, we must also address the crushing cost of health care. At Gilchrist Center, um, I remember making rounds there, and one of our patients had a son in the building, and he watched it go down. And it, it chokes me up a little bit thinking about that, because it was, it was a, a profound event, I think, for the nation, and also it became very, very personal to us as a team. Um, and so we rallied our grief services and um, to help this man who was dying, who had just lost his son. When you go through American cities and seeing people sleeping in the streets and under bridges and that sort of thing, there's something you've got to do. I mean, there's something that has to be done. Our president left to go to another institution. So we had to do a search for a president of the hospital and CEO. Immediately we were faced with what do we want our next CEO to be, what do we, what kind of person, what are we looking for? At the same time, healthcare costs were rising, you know, substantially. There was a lot of focus to figure out how to, you know, contain some of that cost, particularly because of Medicare and a number of other things. We had the good fortune to find Dr. Chassar, who was already well versed in affordable care issues, of medical home issues and all of that. So shortly after Dr. Chassar came on board, we had a retreat for the board and for selected physician leaders and volunteers at Martingham over on the Eastern Shore. It was a two-day retreat, and it was a visioning retreat talking about what do we want healthcare to look like for our organization 10, 15, 20 years down the road. This was, in many respects, very scary for doctors. The way they had made their money in, in the past, the way they paid for medical school, all of that, they were beginning to question, how are they going to be able to survive? When I arrived in the summer of 2010, our board was nervous. There was a lot of yelling about health care reform. I reflect on this, people were yelling a lot. They had no idea what they were yelling about, but they were yelling, and our board was nervous. They loved GBMC, they wanted the decision-making to remain with the GBMC community. They were nervous about ceding the ownership of GBMC to someone else, and they didn't really know what to do. So we went off on a board visioning retreat, and we confronted the facts. The facts were that the U.S. had the best health care employees, the doctors and nurses were the best, but they were operating in a broken system. The retreat was very informative in a couple of ways. First of all, it allowed a lot of different constituents of the hospital to talk to each other in a setting where we were sort of in an intellectual mode as opposed to someone having a particular um, issue or agenda that they were trying to promote. But the second thing that was really important about the retreat was that what we did was we, we asked questions like, what do you envision healthcare looking like 10 years from now? And how is that gonna be delivered? The biggest thing that came out of the 2010 uh, board retreat was really the direction of the hospital, looking at the landscape of healthcare, looking at the legislation coming out of Washington, what would healthcare look like over the next five to 10 years with that? And the real direction was to develop the patient-centered medical home to build up primary care practices and such that they can really provide the kind of care that uh, you'd want for your loved ones. So it's really a comprehensive care. It's not the cheapest care. It requires a lot more investment into the practices, a lot more care management to follow the disease patterns very carefully, make sure they get the right treatment they need for their diseases all along. And that was really a real change for GBMC. It was not for the faint of heart where we were headed. I'm sure some of our board members, we were second guessing ourselves, but I think time has shown that it was definitely the right direction for us to take. Advanced primary care, also called the patient-centered medical home, anticipates the needs of the patient 
and is there for the patient and must therefore have ex things like extended hours, must have information electronically available to all. We have now built our first physical site for patient-centeredness. In 2010 and prior to that when we were working in an individual practice, I often wondered why the hospital would want to employ a primary care physician. So when I went into primary care, I wanted to take care of patients. I believed in prevention. I believed in keeping them out of the hospital, not putting them into the hospital. So for a hospital to want to employ primary care physicians didn't really make sense to me. It seemed like we had competing priorities. The hospital was really about taking care of patients that were hospitalized, and I wanted to keep them out of the hospital. So. In 2007, as we started developing this theory about patient-centered medical home or way of practicing, it really helped me to understand how the hospital wanted to take care of patients the same way that I wanted to take care of patients. It's really about the care coordination of the patients. When I go to my primary care physician, they're looking out for me, they're treating me the way that they would take care of their own family member. They're looking at my full health picture, GBMC Healthcare is out in front because we've now, we're now designing a system that actually will meet the patient's needs and do it in the most cost-effective way. We want to get rid of that 40% waste in the U.S. healthcare system. There's a tremendous amount of research that goes on here, and people don't know that. They know about the care that happens here, but there are tremendous research projects that are going on here, major funding for cancer, for urology, and a number of other areas where the research is just tremendous. And this is a community hospital. That doesn't happen at community hospitals. Gilchrist is more than a hospice. Recently, we launched Gilchrist Services, which is an umbrella organization that encompasses care for patients with advanced illness. So it consists of Gilchrist Hospice, Gilchrist Greater Living, which is our geriatric practice, Gilchrist Kids and Perinatal Support, Gilchrist Grief and Volunteer Support, Gilchrist Transitions, which is a program for patients who are not in hospice but have advanced illness, and then our Support Our Elders program, which is an in-home um, medical care and care coordination program for our elders. I think that GBMC has really invested their time and their money and their leadership in trying to care for the greater community. They believe in taking care of the patient and not just looking at the patient at their hospital, but looking at how that patient is part of the community and what we need to be doing in the community to support that patient. We think our vision, if it works, with the patient being first and focusing on wellness of the community will hold the hospital in good stead and the organization in good stead for years going forward. I'm on my way out and I want to go out in a blaze of glory and give all the credit due to the people that have done what they've done for this community. And that's, that's it. Give them, what they're, give them what they deserve. Give them the credit. It's a lot of work involved in, in something like GBMC. And I don't think the average person realizes that day in, day out, people that have just worked and worked and worked and dedicated their lives to it. The doctors I've seen, even though it's been a short period, are just so dedicated. And I know they all are in their own way. But this is special because it's, um, it's different. It was two little streets with, divided by Charles Street. And we've got a lot to be proud of. 50 years of triumph, collaboration, care, medical advances, and service to the community. That's GBMC at 50. For more information on GBMC or how you can find a physician that's right for you, visit gbmc.org or you can call 443-849-GBMC. I'm Jamie Costello wishing you good health.